Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. David Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new teen therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. David is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Hi, David. Hello, Rhonda. And How hi. are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Hello, everybody. Hi, hi Dave. Dave. Hi, Dave. Hello, hello. Happy to see you. Thank you for joining us today. Well, it's always a pleasure and an honor. Nice. Did I already say welcome to episode 171? No, you can say it now. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to episode 171. I'm... What number is that? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, excuse me, I'd like to start off with um, reading really two lovely tributes that people emailed to you that they're so sweet. Um, the one is by um, somebody who comes regularly on our, on our Sunday hikes. And he wrote you, Hi, David. Actually, I just finished listening to your podcast with Sarah, which was episode 162 that was posted on October 14th of 2019. So he says, I just listened to your podcast with Sarah. It was incredible. I had seen her video already in your anxiety workshop in May. Without a doubt, your podcast and book should reach millions. We are sp all spreading the work and I'm sure it will soon become viral. I am also eagerly waiting for the new website. I know Michael is diligently working on it and it will be ready very soon. I can't wait to see it. Once it is ready, I will send it to my alumni group and a couple of other email lists I subscribe to. We had a great hike, and I'll see you next Sunday. Thanks. Thank you, Vivek. I really appreciate that. And I might mention that I forgot to link to the Sarah video in the show notes that went out with the podcast. And someone pointed that out, and so I completed the link. So if you want to see the 30 seconds when... Uh, Sarah was cured of 20 years of OCD. You can now reload the show notes from that podcast and then click that link and you'll be able to see this amazing video where she's standing outside the Behavioral Sciences Building, putting her hands inside of this grimy, horrible trash barrel that's all filled with slime and goo, and then puts it on her face. And, uh, you know, the, the, like her worst nightmare came yeah. true. And then when we went back to the seminar room, it uh, took about a, about a minute to, to, to walk back there to the seminar room. Her anxiety had gone from 200 out of 100 to, <laughs> to 1, and, she was, and she's been in a state of euphoria ever since. Yeah. And one other funny thing is how easy it is to, to get infected by negative thoughts that when you see them in someone else. And actually, a lot of the therapists there were shocked that I had her put her hand in, the hand in there and rub it on her face. Of course, I did the same thing. And, and they have these sterile wipes next to the door. And the they were saying, oh, give her the sterile wipes. You know, the therapists were getting freaked out by the contamination. And I got an email just yesterday from someone who, who said, but, you know, how about her health? Isn't she in danger? Or couldn't this be radical, these, these techniques. And of course, you always want to use techniques with sensib sensibleness and, and, and thoughtfulness. But uh, what, a, what an amazing moment that was. Yeah. And, you know, I just pulled up the, e the email that Sarah sent where she said, um, I've been sharing the podcast with others and have gotten a lot of positive feedback. And I just love listening to the podcast. It's wonderful. And it's amazing how wonderful it feels not to be perfect. And um, most important, loving and accepting the imperfect me, which has only been possible after the death of my two egos. Yeah, yeah, that, that is so great. I just, I just love Sarah. And uh, after the Tuesday group last week, which was, you know, one week ago at the end, she came up and she was again just bursting with joy and enthusiasm. So proud of that podcast, so proud of that, yeah. that video. So when you're saying uh, to easy of getting infected just to, to, for clarity so you're saying that the the therapists in this case 
who saw her putting her ha- yeah 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 and someone thought, oh my mm-hmm. gosh this really is radical you're not supposed to touch a trash barrel and uh-huh. and and stuff like, like like this and it's interesting you know you could see how people could pick this up from parents and stuff so what do you think was are they infected by negative thoughts or is it just bringing out their own negative thoughts well it's whatever whatever view you you, you want maybe they already had some of them fears of contamination and and, and that type of thing because therapists are no different from anyone except we're probably slightly more neurotic than the average person <laughs> that's why we went into this field so there's a lot to be said for for, for both of those also I wanted to say, uh, before we go to the second endorsement, um, since this is December 16th, see, it's not December 16th yet, but you folks will hear this on December 16th. So would it be appropriate to say, you know, happy holidays to, to I people? I think so, absolutely. We've got Rosh Hashanah coming up. Is that No. no? Is that in Sorry, September? That's, yeah, that's past. We have Hanukkah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Hanukkah. We've got Hanukkah and we've got Christmas and probably other ones too. I think most religions have something happening around, you know, the... the There's a Kwanzaa celebration at the end of the month. Yeah. 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 So happy holidays uh, nice. for everyone too. Great. Um, so here's your next one. It's kind of short but and it came through on YouTube and someone wrote... Your channel is a golden mine. I'm reading your book, which is mind blowing. Thank you so much. And what was that person's name? Bert. Bert. Thank you for that, Bert. And thank you all of you. I, I, I'm getting actually, I, you know, multiple endorsements unsolicited every day from people who say the the book "Feeling Good" was great or helped them change their life. That the podcasts are saving their lives. If you're a, a therapist, recommend the "Feeling Good" podcast to your patients. It's free of charge and may very well accelerate accelerate their their recovery. And I also want to announce that one week ago, not December sixteenth, but today, which is still in uh, you know a couple months, but before that, this is in October. But I had a contract for feeling good, but I had to submit the book to see if they really want it. They, the updated version? Well, they had only seen two chapters when they signed the contract. Wow. And, uh, and then they had the right to reject it. Oh. And PESI, P-E-S-I, is the publisher. So even though they signed a contract and they Well, they saw two chapters it. in the table of contents, and they, they made a bid for it based on, on that. That's the way I set it up. But then they had the option to reject it and get their deposit back if if they didn't like it. So I sent it to them last Tuesday. Just said, well, it's more or less done now. Just get it over with. And then I got a an email from Linda Jackson, who's the publisher at Pete Pesce, and it was just the sweetest thing in the world. She said she'd read it already. She's totally in love with it. She said, you have a beautiful writing style and they're very excited to get on with the editing and the marketing and they're working with a New York PR firm who they think they're gonna use. And also they're gonna have two editors get in a competition and they'll each edit a portion and then we're gonna decide which which is the most suit, does the most suitable, the most impressive editing. So, so it's how, do you, the, how do you feel about your work being edited by other people? Very much good if, if they're a good editor because like my daughter was a great editor, my wife is a great editor, and occasionally I've had great editors who can take, see my writing tends to be a little, little over, overwritten because I just have so much to say and I think it's all you know, worth its weight in gold and, and other people have a limited attention span. And so a good editor can take out up, up to 40% of what's already tightly written uh-huh. without losing anything. And then it just becomes more beautiful and more powerful uh-huh. and more to, to the point. And, and so I, I, love, I love that kind of editor, but they've got to be skillful because you don't want them to be cutting your fingers off. Right, 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 right. that's uh, scary. But, but, uh, but the editing is another, another high art, art form. And my daughter is not available anymore. She's a full-time mom and she's got her hands full with, with stuff, but she edited uh, Feeling Good Together and One Panic Attacks. And she was just great to work with. My wife was great to work with. But, do, you, uh, do you like the writing process? I love it. That's why I write all the time. You know, just I, I run down here and I love answering emails. And I'm saying that's one of the reasons I'm so rushed all the time is people will send me, who I've never heard of, will send me some question 
And I just fall in love with the fact that they're asking me this question, and it's a good question, and then I'll get involved in often fairly extensive dialogues with people, and it's, it's very time consuming, but it, it's rewarding to me. Uh, that's neat. Uh, my father was a minister, and, and we, I don't know if you know what a church bulletin is, but it, you know they, every Sunday you go to church and you get the mm -hmm. bulletin with the title of the sermon and announcements. And I always admired the fact that he had these short little like announcements that were so pithy and so, so well written. And I always thought, boy, I wish I could learn to, to write like that. And then I, you know, I, I work at my writing like jogging, but I don't have to push myself to do it mm -hmm. because it just fun. It's really fun. That's neat. Yeah. Well, this episode, we're going to do another Ask David, where, where you answer questions that people have um, emailed to you. And we have about five questions. <clears throat> um, is it possible to treat burnout? Can negative feelings make physical pain worse? Does emotional trauma cause brain damage? Do you have, a, do you have to have a good cry when something traumatic happens? And why does avoidance make anxiety worse? So let's start with the first one. This is from a, li a listener named Elizabeth. And I might add that Elizabeth is from Sweden. Nice. Since I am 100% Swedish, I always get excited when I hear from someone from Sweden. I think we have two uh, people been sending questions recently from Sweden. Nice. And she writes to you, Hi, David. I've been listening to your podcast for a while now, and it has helped and has encouraged me and made me feel less alone. Thank you for your work and sharing your podcast with us. My situation now is very much defined by my burnout syndrome. In parentheses, she writes, a medical diagnosis in Sweden, not sure about the US. And or depression. From what I've learned, there is no evidence of CBT as a treatment for burnout. Really nothing other than adaptations at your workplace. What triggered me to, quote, hit the wall, unquote, was studying too hard and not giving my body and mind time to recover. Do you have any thoughts on burnout and effective treatment of it? I feel I have made huge progress in the underlying reasons to my burnout, like perfectionism, performance-based self-esteem, figuring out how I want my life to be, who I am, etc. Although that last one is a big one. All this with the help of CBT and other sorts of therapy. What remains is mental fatigue on and off anxiety, not being able to focus, and hardly any mental or emotional resilience. Through healthcare, you're basically treated for depression, the treatment being antidepressants. I've been on sick leave full time for over four years now. I'm in my late 20s and I'm constantly frustrated, sad, and feeling stuck. I want to get going towards this life I now know that I want, but I don't seem to get any better. I eat and sleep well, and I exercise. I realize this could be a complete medical question, but really nobody seems to know anything about burnout. It's a long question, but hey ho, I would be grateful for any thoughts you might have. Thanks again. Sincerely, Elizabeth. Right. Well, um, I, I love this, this question, and I might say I sent out, I got a, a review article from the uh, brain uh, researcher Mark Noble, who we've been working with. And he found a tremendous new article by Irving Kirsch and other world-renowned scientists reviewing the whole literature, everything that's ever been published on antidepressants in the world literature in any language. And they've, they've come to the conclusion that there's, there's no evidence at all that anti, the chemicals called antidepressants have meaningful antidepressant effects. And, and they've also come for the first time to the recommendation that these chemicals should not be prescribed for people with major depressive uh, disorder. And I'll try to remember to link that in the show notes. If you go to feelinggood.com and you, you can listen to the uh, Feeling Good podcast on my, on my website, or you can sign up on the website and you'll get email a notification every time there's a podcast and then you get all the, the show notes. And so, so I'll, not, can I'll, I say, I'll add that. Yeah, I read that article because he sent it to me too, or maybe sent it to a whole group. And he, you know, what I recall from the article, in addition that the antidepressant medication doesn't work, is that there's tremendous side effects yeah. that, that aren't, that are damaging to people. Yeah. And I'm not telling people to go off your antidepressants. You, you only do that or whatever in conjunction with your medical doctor. Uh, and, and they do have a placebo effect, so people can take them and, and feel better. 
but had they been prescribed a, a placebo, they would have gotten got the same effect. And it's it's kind of discouraging uh, for for people who have a strong a strong belief in, in these kind of medications. And and some uh, psychiatric medications are life saving. I'm not against all psychiatric medication psychiatric medications. But at any rate, coming to your is a, a interesting question. Uh, and there's actually no such thing as burnout. Uh, what 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 does that's just a buzzword and and buzzwords are you know they get popular oh i'm burned out but that doesn't mean anything that's not a syndrome what what happens is negative events and negative emotions and people get upset by specific things and when i was in clinical practice i i never got burned out uh, if i i used to have 17 patients on on wednesdays alone and as the day went on i got higher and more euphoric the only time I would get upset is if something happened that, that, I, that I regretted. I, I said something that hurt someone's feelings or, or wasn't effective with someone or was worried about someone who was maybe suicidal or, or something like that. But it's my thoughts. You see, the cognitive model is only your thoughts can, can, can affect your emotions. And so I've always found that when I was in practice, if I was feeling unhappy with my practice or angry or frustrated or inadequate, I would try to pinpoint what was the specific thing that happened with what patient. And, and then how, how can I solve the, this problem or change my thinking uh, about this, this, this patient? And I can give you a really good example because I think being a mental health professional is, is one of the most stressful so-called, there's no such thing as stress either, that's just a buzz, buzzword, but you can certainly get anxious and angry and upset and feel inadequate. And they say, the people who direct planes in and out of airports, what do they call them? Air traffic controllers. Yeah, air traffic controllers. That's supposed to be the world's most stressful profession. But I, I think that uh, being a psychiatrist for people who are suicidal and, and, and threatening is, 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 is at least, if not more, stressful than that. And to give you a, 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 an example, can I give a quick story? Or? Of course. The, I, I, one of the most stressful events I ever had as a, a patient, I, I had a, a man referred to me who, who had uh, what's called, uh, what he, he had a very severe form of depression that also involves kind of manipulating people. And he would often, before he was referred to me, uh, I, I found out that he would often call his psychiatrist with a gun to his head and say, if you don't X, do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to blow my brains out at this very moment. Wow. And, and so he was very, uh, very aggressive and, and very uh, threatening. And then I had referred him to my student, Jackie Persons, who's brilliant, a psychologist, and she moved to California and referred him back to me. And then he was my patient. She came out here and started her center. She now has a research and treatment center in San Francisco and Oakland and is really a, a cool lady and a tremendously brilliant per person. And so I started treating him. And then this was about the time that my book Feeling Good came out. And I couldn't get any radio or anything because my publisher wouldn't support it. They didn't think it had any future. And then I had a chance to get on Ma Maury Povich's local TV show, which he had just had a local show with a live audience in Philadelphia, but it was my first chance to get a little media exposure. And I was so excited, and they even had it in the TV guy, Dr. David Burns is gonna have the Feeling Good show with Maury Povich. I thought, oh man, this is, this, this is awesome. And uh, they, they were gonna, send a car to pick me up. All the timing was real tight. I went to my office and saw a patient and then they were, I had to rush downstairs to get in the car to make it to the TV show on time for this live audience. And just before that car arrived, I, I got a call from this patient and he says, oh, Dr. Burns, I, I just wanted to call and thank you for the wonderful help you've been giving me. And I saw you're gonna be on the Feeling Good show today. And I just wanted to let you know that while you're on the show, I'm going to be committing suicide. And, uh, but, uh, uh, but don't try to call the police or anything because I'm, I'm I've left my apartment and I'm somewhere where you cannot get a hold of me. And then he hung up on me. Now that was somewhat stressful. <laughs> it was horrible. Oh and I God. thought, what am I going to do? I said, well, I can't track him down and maybe I'll just go and do the TV show. Just 
but I, I was. How could oh, you oh, be so? I mean, how could you focus on this TV show? And it was. I was just guy? freaked out. To, yeah. Totally freaked out. Yeah. And so I went down, got in the car, and, and got to, to the studio just in time. And there was Maury, and we were just walking out to see this this live audience of people this, for the feeling good. And I said, well, you know, life is very stressful, and <laughs> horrible things happen to all of us. Now, you all have sons and daughters, and we all have bumps in the road. Let me tell you what just happened to me. And then I described it. And then all the people talked about their own issues, and it was just a fabulous show because it was you know warm and open and you know it, 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 it was just it was fantastic and 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 then i rushed back to my office you know and so i got yeah. to get in touch with the police or what am i going to do and then there was another message for him uh, on the line and he says oh by the way before committing suicide uh, I, I decided to just stop by at a local bar and watch your show and it was awesome. And, and I think I'd like to come in for an appointment later this afternoon if you've oh. got an opening. So oh. he came in and we had a, a great session. But, wow. uh, but again, it's only uh, specific things that happen. But are you saying that someone else that could have happened to might take that incident and say, oh, I get this phone call on the way to a TV show that someone is going to kill themselves immediately and there's nothing I can do. And their thoughts about it or their emotional reaction would lead them to say, I am so burnt out, I can't do this job anymore. Yeah, but what they're really, yeah, but what they're really saying, I'm angry, I'm, I'm ticked off at this patient, I feel inadequate, I feel, feel guilty, I feel ashamed, and I'm no good, and life is no good. You're giving yourself these, these, these distorted messages, and that's what we can deal with so beautifully in Team CBT, as well as the, the cognitive therapy, we, the less effective but also pretty good cognitive therapy we, we had before that. And so when you feel burned out, you want to pull out a daily mood log and what is the event, what are your feelings, what, what are your negative thoughts, what, what are the distortions in them, and, 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 that, and that type of thing. And I have found any time I'm upset, it's, it's always something specific, and when I work on my own negative thoughts or find a plan to solve whatever problems bug bugging me, then, then I feel, feel happy again. So it's a positive message here for fellow Swede Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. So she said she's been on um, she's been on sick leave for four years. So, oh, that well, that's so good? sad to hear because yeah, she sounds like such a tremendous a tremendous person. Yeah. And, uh, but that that's what depression depression can 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 do to to you. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe she should fly out to uh, the Feeling Good Institute in, and in have Mountain a marathon View. Session. Yeah, that with with Kevin Cornelius or, or Kyle Jones. They're both brilliant and they're in the reduced fee clinic and uh, you know it'd be it would be affordable maybe a two-day intensive would turn her life around and then she could meet her fellow swede dr burns too that would uh, be real, such a great go on a sunday hike yeah that would be exciting okay here's our is next... that okay anything else or <clears throat> um no that sounds great there was a you know F fabrice who used to obviously be the the co-host here he he sent a quote around in one of his emails that was about um, exhaustion that kind of um, caught my um, caught my uh, ear eye um, <clears throat> and it was basically said I'm condensing here but the reason if if burnout and exhaustion are the same and they may not be yeah yeah it's that, similar um, <clears throat> that uh, the antidote to exhaustion is not necessarily rest. The antidote to exhaustion is wholeheartedness. The reason you're so exhausted is that much of what you are doing you have no affection for. You're doing it because you have an abstract idea that this is what you should be doing in order to be liked. And that's a quote that... Uh, well, that's often true, too. Yeah. Interesting I love that Fabrice always ends his emails with some yeah. mystical quote or something. Mm -hmm. He's got some really good ones. What, what do you take that to mean? I mean, my sense is that... Sometimes, you know, you're like you were talking before about writing. You love yeah. to come down here and write. Right? Yeah. I mean, you that's wholeheartedness. Yeah. Versus the person that might not love to write and is forcing themselves to write. Yeah. Um, and it may not be wholehearted for them. And so I guess then the question would be, can they change their thoughts around making it more wholehearted? Or maybe there's just it's not it's not something that they're genuinely 
connected, you know, wholehearted about and to... Well, I'm not so much in moving into positive thoughts, but, yeah. but rather smashing negative thoughts. Yeah. And so if you have, have a job that you're unhappy about and you're angry and frustrated and inadequate, then I would, you know, do, do a daily mood log. Just because you have a boring job, it doesn't mean, you know, you're going to be unhappy. When I was in, in college, I used to do construction labor in the summer in Phoenix where it was 110 in the shade and there was no shade. And it was like where we were working in the sun, it was like 135. And, and I remember I would work with pick and shovel, uh, dig a hole in this very hard gravelly thing and I have to use the jackhammer, maybe dig a hole eight feet by four feet by four feet deep. And I just slave over it. And then the foreman would come by and say, you fill that back in, you did that too fast. <laughs> because they were worried about you know yeah. running out of work like a, and getting a pink slip at the end yeah. of the work at the week, which means you're you're laid laid off, and there was nothing very fancy about what we were doing. I I used the the, the broom and would you know be working in the warehouse and getting all the dirt off the floor and digging that, those two two things. But I worked with uh, like a, a black and Mexican laborers and like Carmen Arbiza was this guy from Mexico that I worked with. And I just felt so honored to be doing what I was doing. And, and they used to tease me all the time. They said, oh, you don't know how to sweep properly. And I've tried to learn how to sweep properly. And it was some of the happiest times I, I ever had. Hmm. But because I just, I was just so grateful to, to be doing this. And so filled with, with joy. And I thought I'm kind of a nerd. And here I'm, I'm actually working out with construction men. And I'm kind of building my muscles a, l a little bit. Yeah. And, and we'd get this high C, special C. And, they, and at the, uh, every 15 minutes, we'd take a, a, a salt tablet so we wouldn't get dehydrated and, and faint. And then at lunch, I, you drink this big thing of this, this sweet, you know, artificial juice that just tasted like heaven but, but you know it, it's not what you're doing it's it, it's the way the way you th you think about it yeah um, that's a neat example okay here's question number two was that okay yeah that, i think that is a exactly the answer that you know take a, a job that one might think would be exhausting and but with the with the right way of approaching it it's it's invigorating yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, ready for question number two? Yeah. More on physical pain. Is it really true that negative feelings can make physical pain worse? Yeah, th this was something I'd wanted to say in our recent podcast of a few weeks ago with uh, David Hanscom on, on back pain, and he was the kind of uh, f former spinal surgeon or back surgeon who, who gave up doing surgery in order to treat people with talking therapy and warmth and support and communication and pinpointing the problems in their life. And I had mentioned research I did at Stanford that showed for the first time that emotional pro feelings like depression, anxiety, and anger have a causal effect on pain, that they, they make pain worse, and that on average 50% of all the pain the chronic pain patients feel come from their emotions. And the neat thing about it is if people have severe physical pain and it can be from a physical illness or, or, or there is no physical illness and they have physical pain. Either way, if they'll overcome their negative feelings, that they'll probably get a significant reduction in physical pain, maybe a total elimination, maybe a 50% reduction and maybe no reduction. But you've got to focus on the feelings if you want the pain to improve. That's one way of improving physical pain without pills. What I didn't get a chance to say is how I figured this out initially before I did the research on it. And, I, and it was this, uh, when I was a medical student, I was a little bit of a wild medical student. And, so know, I've heard that about you. To say the least. And, uh, and what I learned on the streets of Palo Alto was, I think, more helpful to me as a psychiatrist than what I would have learned in the medical school classes I was so often cutting and not attending, and I was a horrible medical student. Those the dangerous streets of, streets of Palo Alto. <laughs> 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 right, right. Well, there was yeah. stuff. It was the, the hippie well, movement, and homes were the, only the uh, merry pranksters were there, <laughs> Ken Kesey, and I went to the Human Bee Inn and Golden Gate Park. Wow. And what was that guy uh, from Harvard? That, that oh, Ram Dass. Yeah, yeah, he was like, tune in, oh, turn on, and drop out. That's what we all did, actually. 
but yeah, you one, really did. one night, my second year, I was uh, drinking beer at this bar in Palo Alto, right across the street from Max Smoke Shop, which I think is still 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 there, and uh, and I heard this commotion, and and I turned, and a fight had broken out. Now I wasn't involved in the in, in the in the fight in the fight. I was just sitting with a buddy dr drinking beer. And I looked and I saw this beer bottle or, or beer mug coming at my face in slow motion, like, like slow motion photography. Wow. And all of a sudden it hit my jaw and, and, and all the glass exploded, oh burst, and blood started coming gushing out of my mouth and I was in severe pain and my teeth were loose. Oh. And so I ran out of the bar and got into my old VW Beetle and drove over to the Stanford emergency room and, and walked in and said, like, I'm a medical student, my jaw is broken, type, type of thing. And I was in intense pain and kind of scared and angry. And I was probably intoxicated and not very cooperative. And, and I, I just, they, you know, got me in a bed and did an x-ray. But I was just frightened but angry and I felt like they weren't treating me ver very well which I'm sure was just my own, you know, aggressive behavior. Uh, but then they, they finally got a, a plastic surgeon to, 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 to come and, and check me out. And, and, and he says, uh, now, now, David, uh, I, I've looked at your x-rays and, and, and your jaw is broken. And so I'm going to hospitalize you right now. And, um, and we're going to do surgery in the morning. And, uh, and I'm going to wire your jaw shut and your, your jaw will be wired shut for, for six weeks or eight weeks or something. And, uh, and then I said, uh, well, uh, am, am, am I, am I going to lose my teeth? Uh, and he said, well, you have several teeth in the front that are real loose, but I, I think they'll, they'll be okay. But after we take the wires off your jaw, then we'll send you to a, you know, a dental surgeon expert guy, and he'll, he'll check out your teeth and, and, and see if they need any, you know, any further work. He says, but it'll probably be okay. But then he said to me, and, and he says, now, David, I know you're in really excruciating pain. And so I've, I've ordered uh, pain shots for you tonight. And uh, you can have as many of them as you want because I want you to be uh, to totally comfortable. Then he put his hand on my shoulder and he says, I just want you to know this is, this is routine and, and you're going to be fine. And when he said that, my pain went from 100 to zero in an instant. And all my pain disappeared. And I never requested a single shot. Hmm. And then after the surgery, I thought, gosh, maybe you better get a couple, it might be fun or something, you know, <laughs> see what it's like. Yeah. So I asked for a couple that I didn't really need just to, <laughs> to get I mean, high. Just... <laughs> but uh, but it, it was it was amazing to me. And, and that was the first time I ever realized the power of, of not only compassion, but also the change in emotion, uh, the effect, the effect on pain. Because it was, you say, I was angry and agitated and anxious at a very high level. And then when, when the emotions improved, the, the, the pain, in my case, completely disappeared. And it was, it was mind-blowing. And then later on, I wanted to find out if this was true in general. And that's when I did the research on about 130 patients at the Stanford inpatient unit, because a lot of them were chronic, chronic pain patients. And then I saw, as I was doing the cognitive therapy groups, many of them, their pain would also completely disappear when I was making their depression and anxiety disappear. Mm -hmm. And then I did the, the causal modeling to, to, to see is this a, a systematic real effect, and it was. You know, when Mark Noble was here on the hike, we were talking about what, what actually is empathy. And it seems like you, you experienced a true moment of empathy from the plastic surgeon, where yeah. he offered you, you know, compassion yeah. And, yeah. Love, and love, and, yeah. and, and that... Help yeah. facilitate the dropping of your pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it was acceptance. Like, yeah, and it was amazing. And I think, like everyone, I was probably hungry for somebody to yeah. love me and accept me. I mean, it sounds kind of ridiculous. You're drunk in an emergency room, and then someone says something nice to you. But it it meant a lot to me, and uh, it taught me something. You know, we had these three more fabulous questions. Maybe we should have a part, a second uh, Ask David podcast, because right now we're at. 
33 minutes, right? Right. And should we should we keep them short? Let's keep them short, short and sweet. Okay, so uh, two quick commercial messages, and then we'll be out of here. Uh, one is uh, pr- pretty soon, and maybe we'll have the new website by the time this comes out, and Michael Simpson's going to help me with getting more followers to the website and the podcast. But right now, our best uh, marketing is word of mouth. And so if you have friends who are therapists or patients or general public, you think they might enjoy the Feeling Good podcasts, they're totally free, helps a lot of people improve or even recover from depression and anxiety. And a lot of people have said the, the Five Secrets podcasts have transformed their their relationships with loved ones and colleagues. So please, uh, please spread the word. And then finally, uh, my first 2020 workshop of the year will be with my incredible colleague, Dr. Jill Levitt. And uh, it's on February 9th, 2020. It'll be again a one day workshop on a Sunday. And there will be seven uh, CE hours credit for mental health professionals. It costs 135 bucks. And if you go to my website, feelinggood.com, you can register and it'll be a one day workshop on the most important topic in all of psychotherapy. It's high speed methods to reduce reduce resistance and boost motivation. And and you'll learn how to reduce the resistance in your patients uh, so you can get vastly faster results and vastly better outcomes and enjoy your clinical work far more because patients who yes but you will no longer be able to resist you successfully. Fantastic. Okay, thank you so much, Dave and David and listeners. Until next time. Thanks. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes to this episode under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. The theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donzel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.